Hi, I'm Tim. Welcome to Watchbox, and thanks for logging on. Today, we have a heavyweight bout between the reigning champion from Geneva and a spunky upstart from Schaffhausen. It's Rolex versus Moser versus Starts Now. Even in its redesigned form, I'm going to say the Rolex Submariner is the better known of these two, so we're going to talk about it second. Let's introduce a watch that a lot of folks are going to be seeing for the first time. This is the H. Moser & C. Pioneer Rotating Bezel Govberg Jewelers Limited Edition. This was a U.S. market Govberg Jewelers 100-piece limited edition for the 2022 model year, and it was the first Moser sports watch that was directly comparable to the Rolex Submariner. Here's why. Previous Pioneers were 42.8 millimeters. They had fixed bezels, they were steel, they were heavy, and they were usually equipped with straps, which made for an imperfect comparison to a 40 millimeter dive watch. Well, the Rolex is now 41 millimeters, and the Moser is directly comparable. So let's take a look at this watch in titanium on my 16 centimeter circumference wrist after reading the spec sheet. 40 millimeters in diameter, 11.6 millimeters thick. If we look at the case, just lug to lug, it's 47.9 millimeters. If we include the end link of the bracelet, the total distance across the wrist is still very reasonable, 48.6. Now on my 16 centimeter circumference wrist, which is flat across the top, you can see the watch wears really nice. All in titanium with sapphire front and back, it's incredibly light. And although it looks thicker than it is, it will slide underneath the cuff. There's no issue there. You could see that the lugs are nowhere near the edge of my wrist, particularly in this down the barrel shot. And from the top, you could see uh, still a really good fit. This watch will fit on a wrist as small as 14 centimeters circumference, and it'll feel like a cloud while doing so. The bracelet features a conforming end link, just like the Rolex, to join it to the case uh, more elegantly with no daylight showing between bracelet and case. You'll note here that although at first glance it appears to be a three-link design like the Rolex, this is actually a two-link design with H-profile primaries and then intermediates. Every single link is removable, so that gives you a high degree of sizing flexibility. Though note, you will need a block and a punch to do it because these are assembled by pin sleeves, so rather than screws, pin sleeves require a block and a punch to size. The bracelet and the clasp likely made by Brogioli and Ticino, which is the bracelet and clasp supplier to Moser. You see the Moser logo externally. All of this media blasted for a low glare finish, just like the case. But externally, we have recesses that are coined, and we have those same coined recesses on the case. So uh, design changes were made. This is not a generic part from Brogioli. We also have the Moser logo externally. Brogioli parts also used by, among others, IWC, Glasuta Original, and Langa on the Odysseus. So this is a high-grade manufacturer. You push the logo, and you gain approximately one centimeter of incremental adjustment. Note, you can use this when the clasp is closed and on the wrist. There's a twin trigger release system and a thick gauge titanium single swing arm internally. You can see the rack system that is released by the push button, and that's exactly how the system works. So about one centimeter and about 10 different increments for fine tuning the fit. The case, the bezel, the bracelet, all of it's media blasted for a low glare look, which I like on a sports watch. Moser watches always have detailed case recesses to remind you that they first machine and then hand finish their cases. We have a no guard profile for this diver, so no crown guards. I don't miss them. Makes the crown easier to grip. It's a Moser branded crown. It's been media blasted. It is a screw down crown, and this watch is 120 meters water resistant. We have a sawtooth knurling outboard. The bezel features a remarkably chunky positive detent. If you feel that bezels cannot feel mechanical enough or be loud enough, this is your bezel. While it is a 60 click rather than 120, you can place it with great precision and the action is comparable to the best 60 click bezels like Doxa subs or Panerai Luminor submersibles. Also, the bezel insert is titanium. There's been a lot of confusion about that and I judged based on its luster that it was aluminum. According to Edward Melon, the CEO of the company, it is titanium and and here's why I think that pays off. You could see that the bezel is inset with little strips of loom. So while the Rolex is well loomed, the Moser is extravagantly so and easily wins the loom comparison. You can see the whole bezel is loomed, making for an easy point of reference at night. Uh, taking a quick look, you can see that the watch includes a signature of Moser, which is a fume fade dial. So light at the center to dark at the edge. It is a metallic sunburst. It's their signature funky blue color. Fume means smoked in French. And though we are in German speaking Schaffhausen here, we're going to use the French nomenclature. We also have solid blocks of ceramic 
ceramic-based loom called Globalite. So we have applique indices and matching inserts on the hands, uh, but they are actually three-dimensional sculptures of loom. And actually, if you look off axis, you could see that they have height above the dial. It's really quite dramatic and attractive. The dial features a flange outboard, so there's not a sheer drop from the bezel down to the dial base. And notice the paucity of printing. You've got Moser, and then you've got Rolex. Rolex has the most recognizable name in watchmaking. Moser probably one of the least, and yet Moser is confident keeping its dial relatively unadorned. You'll also note they don't list Swiss made. Swiss made means 60% Swiss content. Moser finds that insulting. Their watches are all 90 to 100 percent in that range, so they've decided to take Swiss made off the dial rather than associate with the lower standard. Flip it all over, display case back. Here's something you don't get on a Rolex, limited edition 100 pieces. There's something you don't get on a Rolex. It is caliber HMC 200. It's a bi-directional automatic winder with a magic leverage type uh, winding system and ceramic bearings for high efficiency and low maintenance. You've got a full balance bridge with a free sprung balance for shock tolerance. It's a three hertz beat rate and it is a 72-hour power reserve. It does have hacking seconds, so you can synchronize it to a reference time. Moser, through its precision engineering subsidiary, makes the escapement assembly as well as the hairspring and the free-sprung balance, so all impressive stuff. Finishing is a combination of manual and mechanical, but that half that's manual is one half more than Rolex offers, and the finishing is also attractive. We've got a gold rotor with four different types of finishing. We've got media blasted recesses, satination, and beveling. We've got beveling on the bridges, which is nicely executed, satination on the balance bridge, black polished screws, Moser's distinctive double-crested coat dish and then you can see a polished ratchet wheel on a satinated barrel with satinated wheels and engine turning on the base plate. And again, all that water resistant down to 120 meters. Now, let's take a look at the Contenders Challenger. This is the force in possession of the field. This is the fighter who wears the belt and has for a long time. First launched in 1953, the Rolex sub along with the Blanc Pan 50 Fathoms was the prototype of the modern dive watch and it is an evergreen design. You can see that redesigned for 2020, not a whole lot has changed and that's by design. The case is larger at 41 millimeters in diameter, though still slim at 12.4 millimeters thick. Lug to lug, the watch is 48.2 millimeters with an end link to end link dimension of 51.4. Now it has a 21 millimeter spacing between the lugs. And when we throw it on my wrist, you can see it really doesn't look any bigger than the previous 40 millimeter model. And that's because for the most part, it's not. It's got the same lug to lug dimension and the same thickness. The changes are small and subtle. It is thin, though it's not Moser thin, and it wears well on my wrist. I could recommend it for a wrist as small as 15 centimeters in circumference. It's got a nice weighting all the way around, but you do feel the difference between a watch with a solid case back and a full steel construction versus one that's got sapphire on the back and full titanium construction. So if you don't like a watch that feels too light, this might be your choice by default. It will fit underneath a cuff. I don't recommend it necessarily for ladies, uh, but in fact, it will wear okay on some female wrists. The bracelet's nicely made. We have another conforming end link, but I should mention Rolex makes everything. Dials, cases, clasps, bracelets. They've got their own foundry. They make their own steel and alloys. They use 904L steel, which is a high nickel content steel that is particularly resistant to corrosion. Of course, if you've got a nickel allergy, then it Advantage Moser plus titanium by its nature is resistant to corrosion. So no huge advantage there. Where Rolex really does have a bit of an advantage is the way the bracelet's put together using screw-fixed removable links because that means you can size it with a jeweler's screwdriver. You don't need a complex block and a punch system. The clasp is also more impressive than Moser's. First, because it feels heavier, more robust. The tolerances feel tighter and snappier. And you've got a double locking factor. You've got this clamshell externally. And then inside, you've got this spring-loaded lever action release with a beak and a hook. So that latches and shuts, and you can't just pull it open. You've got to actually unlatch it using a lever. Internally, it's nicely finished with full polish. And then you've got Easy Link, which is a 20 millimeter, 10-step incremental adjustment mechanism. So if you want to just pull it out all the way and fit it over a wetsuit or a dry suit, you can do that as a diver. But if you want to make two millimeter incremental adjustments for sizing, you can do that too. Plus here, you can see we have some intermediate-sized links in case you're in between sizes. So you've got a couple of different ways to size this, and the assembly of the clasp is just more impressive in general. We've got a case that is the so-called super case, though the current generation of the sub features a larger end link and thinner lugs for more elaborately 
tapered profile that's more elegant. And we've got a trip lock crown in steel. You know that because you have three symmetrical dots. This is 300 meters water resistant versus 120 on the Moser. The bezel here is 120 click and it beats the Moser on absolute precision for that reason as well as the feeling of refinement. It has a well-defined detent but the sensation of a silky glide is unmatched. We've also got a bezel insert in scratch resistant ceramic with the indices and the numerals actually infilled with platinum and on the dial we have black lacquer with white gold hands as well as indices. While I do enjoy the magnitude of the loom on the Moser. It is important to note that between the two, only the Rolex offers a loomed seconds hand. So that's the Rolex's one advantage with regard to loom. You do know that it's running in the dark, including while diving in the depths. The watch features Rolex caliber 3230, which is the latest version. It dispenses with the old jeweled staff for a winding rotor on a ball bearing. It's a 70 hour power reserve. It has stopped seconds. It's got a four hertz beat rate, which is a little bit higher than the three hertz of the Moser, making the watch both potentially a bit more accurate as well as more shock resistant from a chronometry standpoint. 31 joules, and it's got a full balance bridge with a free sprung balance like the Moser, but it's also got an overcoil hairspring, so it will keep more consistent time in different positions, whereas the flat hairspring in the Moser, while accomplished, can't quite achieve that. Also important that with the anti-magnetic nickel phosphorus chronergy escapement and anti-magnetic balance balance staff and niobium zirconium hairspring, this is a highly anti-magnetic watch. The timepiece has also been adjusted so that it runs no worse than plus two, minus two seconds per 24 hours from the factory. Now, let's talk about the advantages of this championship timepiece. This is the heavyweight champ for a long time. It's got the belt, and there's a reason for that. It has evergreen design. There's no planned obsolescence at Rolex. The first Rolex sub-buyer in the 1950s would likely recognize this watch as a descendant of his watch, and I guarantee you in 2053 for the sub-100, this watch will still be recognizable as a Submariner. It is evergreen. It is like a Porsche 911. It never gets old. It's also got a far super superior clasp between the way it feels, the solidity, the finish, and the double locking factor with the 10 two millimeter increments of adjustment in the glide lock system, this is a better clasp than the one you find on the Moser. The bezel is superior on a couple of levels. First, 120 clicks versus 60. The feeling of refinement is unmatched. Plus, you get the ceramic insert with the platinum infill. So while the bezel is not fully loomed and it's not quite as loud as the Moser, it feels more expensive and it does offer better scratch and abrasion resistance. Investment grade. Uh, this is a watch that gains value out of the showroom. It costs $9,100 new and pre-owned it's about twelve dollars to $13,000. Uh, this costs $20,000 new and it sells for about that pre-owned, which is to say it holds its value, but this one is a money maker and it's likely to stay that way. Warranty. Five-year warranty, two-year warranty. That matters if you're buying new, but it also matters if you're buying pre-owned, because one-year-old, this watch only have one-year warranty left. This one will have four. 300 meters versus 120 meters. A lot of this is theoretical, but luxury is about getting more than you need, and Rolex gives you more than the Moser. Also, there is the magnetism issue. Both of these watches would meet the ISO 764, but that only specifies 4,800 ampere per meter. This watch is likely resilient to thousands of Gauss. With the hardware inside, it's not merely 80,000 ampere per meter, which is mil Gauss. It is probably hundreds of thousands of ampere per meter versus 4,800 here. So if magnetism is important to you, and it's important to me because of the powerful magnets in my laptop, this watch has a clear advantage and it has a timing advantage. While the Mosers are well adjusted and could probably meet the chronometer standard, Rolex goes so far beyond that that it is surpassing. Plus two, minus two seconds per 24 hours tested in six positions as a fully assembled watch and backed with a warranty guaranteeing that accuracy. Moser is not guaranteeing a number, so advantage Rolex. Plus, you've got this screw-fixed bracelet with intermediate-sized links, and that's just easier to size, and with the intermediate-sized link, it gives you an intermediate option uh, that you don't get with the Moser bracelet, which has all or nothing full-sized links, even if they are all removable. And if you want your watch to be all Rolex, 
batter up. Dial, hands, indices, bracelet, clasp, case, movement, even the shock protection and the lubricants in the Rolex are made by Rolex. Moser does not make its dials, cases, clasps, or bracelets, though it is an accomplished movement manufacturer, and it uses the best Swiss suppliers still for vertical integration. You know what you're buying with Rolex. Your money is paying for all of those facilities and refinements. Now, what does the Moser offer? Well, first and foremost, no brand baggage. With a Rolex, people will ask, is it real? What does it cost? How much do you make? All sorts of uninvited and unwelcome questions. And every once in a while, they might even case you for a five to 10 finger discount, uh, thinking about snatching your watch, perhaps with your wrist still attached. That's a thing with Rolex and visible brands that are well known. It's less of a thing with small, low profile brands like Moser. Uh, there is the display case back. I like to see my movements and this one looks good. So advantage Moser on that front. High horology appeal. Moser makes two to 3,000 watches a year. It invests considerable hand finishing within and without its watches. This is a company that makes tourbillon, minute repeater, and perpetual calendars. Rolex makes chronographs and dual times, and everything except the setting of the movement into the case is fully automated. This is both high horology and artisanal, and on that basis, there's a lot to love. The brand itself is more exclusive, making its two to 3K a year to Rolex's one million, but this 100-piece model Model adds even more exclusivity. I'm also going to mention that although the clasp overall isn't as good as the Rolex, it is easier to adjust on the wrist, whereas glide lock cannot be adjusted on the wrist unless you get a deep C. Also important to note, this watch has a loom that's so much better, it's not even funny. So as a sports watch, it has a huge advantage on that front. Plus, this watch has factory strap options available that look properly tailored to the watch, whereas if you want a strap for a Rolex, you've got to go aftermarket. Now, what else can I tell you? I love this media blasted subdued satin finish. The Rolex has some big bling and from certain angles, it will blind you with glare. That's not a thing on the Moser. And as with the Loom, that's a big sports watch advantage. I like the loudness and sharpness of this bezel. True, 60 clicks isn't as refined as 120, but from a practical standpoint, it's not a big deal for locating the bezel. And it just feels so chunky and loud and positive. It makes the experience its theater in and of itself. Now, cleaner dial, Rolex, everyone knows who you are. Without a name, people are still going to know this is a Rolex dial. So why print a tome? Moser understands that sometimes less is more. Plus, it is thinner and lighter and easier for me to wear on my wrist. So if you have a small wrist, this is going to be your option. Plus, Hans Wilsdorf is dead and his successors are inaccessible. You don't talk to Mr. Rolex, whoever Mr. Rolex is today. Whereas with Moser, the Melan family owns the company and the brothers Bertrand and Edward, Edward is the CEO, they're live on social media practically every day, very accessible. If you email them, they will email you back, even give you the personal phone number if you are a Moser collector. And that level of accessibility, personal service, and friendship that comes with owning this watch, whether you buy it new or used, is a big part of the appeal. So which one do I choose? There's lots to love with the sub, and it actually made this very close. When you consider that this costs 9100 bucks if you can get it new, and this costs 20000 whether it's new or used, it's got a pretty much identical new and pre-owned profile. This one is actually starting a little bit behind because of the price handicap, but it makes up all the ground because to me, it is more special. The Melons are very cool folks, and I like having a relationship with my watch brand that's not possible with Rolex. This is a watch that is rare, that is fine, that is extensively handcrafted and hand finished. The loom quality is superb, the bezel is loud and chunky, and it's far more comfortable on my wrist. You guys, though, may reach different conclusions, especially when price is factored in. There's still a seven grand price differential if you buy the Rolex used. So let me know in the comments below which of these two watches is your personal favorite and which one takes the title.